welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this event, um, the first event of Rodemos el Dialogo in 2021. We are delighted to see so many of you here uh, interested in this really important uh, seminar, um, Embrace Dialogue seminar with Professor Joan Rappaport and with the discussion of Pilar Riaño. I'm not gonna introduce our special guests because Gwen, our chair, will do that. But I just would, would like to say that we know that 2021 starts with very serious challenges. And here in Rodemos el Dialogo, we are trying to continue working together, bringing people together to find ways to uh, build a better world. And of course, a better Colombia, a Colombia in peace. And we know that the role of academia is really important on that. As some of you might know, Rodemos el Dialogo is a peace building organization that was set up in 2012. And Rodemos el Dialogo has for the last eight years been promoting six principles. And these principles are what we believe the pillars uh, that we need in order to nurture a culture of dialogue. All our events are run based on those principles. So I would like to put those principles to start with. So the first principle is that we are inviting you to think about co-responsibility. So how we all have a, play, uh, a part to play in peace building in Colombia. Then the second one is we invite you in that in this time space, you give the best of you. That's what we call the principle of generosity. We also expect that because people have different points of view, we apply a third principle that is the principle of respect, uh, understanding that people have from different paths in life. Um, that brings me to the fourth principle that is the principle of self-criticism. We all have prejudices and sometimes an imperfect knowledge. So we hope that this space is a space for us to reflect on that. The fifth principle is honesty. We expect to build a safe space for you to say what you think. So we really invite you to speak and to ask questions. And finally, the last principle is the principle of solidarity. And we believe that in particular, this topic that has to do with the incredible work of Orlando Falls Borda brings us the importance of thinking about how we are part of a bigger world where people need our help. So those are the six principles that we wanna put on the table for this event. And um, before handing over to Gwen, I would just like to say that Rodemos el Dialogo is doing these uh, events uh, for academics to come together with practitioners and to reflect on these issues. But we also do work with teams that are supporting the work of the Colombian Truth Commission, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace. We have a team trying to do research on how to bring the ELN back into a negotiation table with the Colombian government. And finally, we have another team that is doing some um, reflections and thinking about how to set up an art and reconciliation lab. So if you are interested to continue finding out the work that we're doing and you want to join us, please go to our website and join um, our database. Without further ado, I hand over the floor to Gwen, who is a junior research fellow at Merton College and is going to be our chair this evening. Gwen. Thank you, Andre, and um, thank you everyone for coming today uh, on behalf of Merton College and Rodemos Dialogo. Welcome. I'm wearing two hats uh, today. Um, and um, I'm extremely grateful to Joanne and to Pilar for accepting this invitation. As Andre said, 2021 is a year full of challenges. And so I think it's a real treat to be able to start our seminar series this year um, with two. Uh, such uh, distinguished speakers. Um, and Embrace Dialogue Academia Seminars is a series that we really, um, we started in, in uh, collaboration with Merton College and Rodemos de Dialogo, really with the idea of creating spaces of dialogue across academia and um, policy. And so these seminars, which are held once a month during term time, not on particular days, depending on the speaker's availability, seek to ask how can recent academic research um, on peace and conflict issues in Colombia help us to illuminate um, contemporary challenges to peace building um, in Colombia. 
and perhaps even more broadly. And I think that um, it's also a very uh, special way to start the year because there couldn't be a more relevant way, a re more relevant topic around which to have that discussion about how to bridge academia and practice as the history and legacy of the work of Orlando Falsborda. Um, and we're extremely lucky to have today Joanne uh, Rappaport um, launching her book, uh, Cowards Don't Make History, um, Orlando Falsborda and the Origins of Participatory Action Research. I highly recommend it. Uh, professor Joanne Rappaport is a, a professor at the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Georgetown University. Um, and her discussant is Professor Pilar de Anuel Cala, a professor at the Social Justice Institute, the University of British Columbia. Um, and the way that we're going to carry out this seminar is first of all, we're going to hand over to Joanne, who's going to speak for about uh, 25 to 35 minutes um, on giving a presentation of, of the book and its um, implications for peace building today. And then we will hand over to Pilar, who will spend about 10 minutes trying to go deeper into the question of what um, the implications of uh, this book could be to considering um, current situations in Colombia. And then we will open up for a Q&A and the format of the Q&A will be, we will um, encourage you all to ask questions and make comments. Um, you're more than welcome to, to um, turn your camera on and ask it yourself uh, so that we don't just get tired of hearing the three of us um, speak, but that we encourage you to participate in the dialogue. Um, if you are able to um, write in the chat that you wish to speak, say me, or I have a question, or I have a comment. If you can't um, turn your camera and microphone on at that moment, you are also welcome to write the question into the chat. And we'll try and take about two, two to three rounds of questions to try to build a dialogue between the two panelists um, and see where we get to. And um, just finally, that as Herman has written in the chat to, for you to be aware that this is being streamed live on YouTube. So there will be a recording available afterwards um, and uh, for you to be aware that that's, that that's happening. So without further ado, um, thank you very much again, all of you for coming and, and giving up your, your evening, afternoon or morning. One of the benefits of the world that we live in today is having these virtual discussions with speakers from all over the world. And I think we have several time zones today. So thank you, especially to Pilar for, for getting up early um, to be here this morning from British Columbia. So uh, Joanne, over to you. Um, and uh, really excited to have this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you see the screen sharing? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you to Gwen. Uh, thanks to Rodamos El Dialogo and to Pilar for doing this. Um, before I start, if there are people here whose English isn't all that good, um, I gave them a longer talk which you could find on the YouTube channel of the Doctorado in Ciencias Sociales of the Universidad Javeriana. And for people who, who's, who have trouble with English. Um, the painting, which is also on the cover of the book, um, it was by, is by Cristo Hoyos, a costeño artist. Uh, the photos that you're going to see in the presentation were taken by, mostly taken by Orlando Falsborda. And I thank the Fundación del Sinu for allowing me to reproduce the comics pages. In the early 1970s, Colombian sociologist Orlando Falsborda and a group of like-minded intellectuals founded La Rosca de Investigación y Acción Social, Circle of Research and Social Action, a network of socially committed scholars engaged in what we would now call activist research. I hope you can all see the photo of Fals. Okay, then we know it's all working. Their purpose was to, deliver, to develop a new interdisciplinary methodology, which they called action research, now called participatory action research or PAR, through which external researchers could articulate their investigations with grassroots social movements. 
More specifically, they propose to collaborate in the recovery of memories of popular struggles of the past in order to resignify their lessons through the political education of activists, ultimately spurring political action. The first experiments with PAR coincided with the rise of a leftist faction called the Sincelejo Line of the National Association of Peasant Users, ANUC, a Colombian peasant organization that had been originally founded in the 1960s by the national government to promote agrarian reform. In addition to collaborating with ANUC, on this map of Colombia, they collaborated with ANUC where the top circle is. Um, La Rosca also set its sights on the indigenous movement, which are the two circles on the bottom right. Um, the indigenous movement burst into national prominence in the early 70s with the founding of CRIC, the Regional Indigenous Council of Cauca. In both cases, organized rural people coalesced around a class-based political program implemented through civil disobedience, in particular through the occupation of large land holdings. On the Caribbean coast, <clears throat> Fals brought together a group of young researchers from the cities of Monteria and Cincelejo into a research team called the Fundacion del Caribe, the Caribbean Foundation, which directly involved peasants in the research process. Files and his young colleagues hoped to create a synergy between research and activism, in which the results of historical research into peasant struggles of the past would inspire rural folks to take political action. Activism would furnish them with a conceptual framework through which they could analyze the results of their investigations. During the last decade, I've dedicated myself to the task of comprehending how Fals and his associates conceptualized their work, focusing in particular on what they meant by research and participation, and how these meetings evolved over the course of the Fundacion del Caribe's collaboration with ANUC which began in 1972 and ended in early 1975. As I'll explain, the under, their understanding of research didn't conform to the social science of the period. They were not engaged in the collection of data in order to produce an objective analysis, but instead strove to forge relations of equality with their peasant interlocutors, who would become co-investigators rather than informants, sharing intellectual authority with Fals and his colleagues. <clears throat> How precisely they achieved this is the subject of this lecture. My presentation summarizes the contents of a book, Cowards Don't Make History, which was published in October. A Spanish translation, El Cobarde No Hace Historia, will come out in the next month or so with the Editorial Universidad del Rosario. I'm also working with a team of Colombian comics creators on a graphic narrative. I came to this project after 10 years of collaboration with various educational programs associated with the indigenous movement of the Southwest Highlands. We set up intercultural research teams to study the history of Creek's bilingual education program and ethnic politics since the 1991 constitution that recognized Colombia as pluriethnic and multicultural. In the course of our work, we generated guiding concepts, theories, arising out of the organizational culture, which would permit us to merge our individual interests and differing, differing epistemologies into a fruitful dialogue. These projects involved a great deal of methodological conversation, inspiring profound intercultural reflection, but also provoking arguments that owed a great deal to our divergent subject positions. I grasp that there was a particular dynamic at play here in which knowledge was emerging out of a very different set of relationships from those of conventional ethnography or oral history. But I felt I was perhaps too closely involved to make sense of how this experiment was unfolding. For this reason, I proposed to move on to a series of ethnographic studies of collaborative research teams in contemporary Latin America, specifically in Argentina, Bolivia, and Mexico, through which I could observe how collaboration produces knowledge. I plan to begin this multi-sided project with a historical appreciation of Fals Borda's work on the Colombian Caribbean coast, which continues to be a major inspiration for today's collaborative researchers. 
Files born in this personal archives were donated before his death to the National University of Colombia in Bogota and the Banco de la República in Monteria. The latter contains his papers related to his work with Anouk on the Caribbean coast, while the former assembles all of his other personal papers. When I first visited these repositories, I assumed that my research would be brief, furnishing only an introduction to the ethnographic research I intended to pursue. But as I waded through the documentation, trying to make sense of Fals's field notes, interview transcripts, and the Fundacion del Caribe's agendas and reports, I realized this was a much larger project than I'd imagined. And if I were to do justice to it, I would have to forego my ethnographic plans and concentrate instead on the extremely brief but incredibly rich three years during which Fels and his associates devised their participatory methodology. Before going into the meanings that Fels Borda injected into research and participation, I must empath emphasize that the experimental methodology of PAR could only arise out of the work of the imagination. On the one hand, Fals's own imaginings of how to tell history from below. On the other, the imaginations of the peasants who collaborated in this activist research endeavor. Imagination is central to Fals's own written historical narrative. In Historia Doble de la Costa, Double History of the Coast, his four volume agrarian history told from the perspective of the peasantry, Fals continuously brings up an idea borrowed from jurisprudence and perhaps from quantitative sociology, imputation, imputacion. He uses this term to refer to the process by which he combines verifiable historical facts with his own imagination to flesh out the skeletal evidence collected in historical archives and in interviews. Throughout the four volumes of Historia Doble, he treats readers to peasant voices woven out of narratives collected from multiple respondents, many of which can be identified in his field notes and in interview transcripts. Additionally, some of the historical figures of Historia Doble are depicted as participants in dialogues that Fals resuscitates from his own imagination. For a long time, I thought that Fals's semi-fictionalization of historical events and narrators was merely a literary vehicle through which he engaged his readers, similar in many respects to the testimonial literature that was appearing in the 1970s in Latin American bookstores. But to the contrary, I discovered that Fals's use of imputation in Historia Doble emerged out of his activist research with Anouk in the early 1970s. In a retrospective analysis of participatory action research published in 1985, he argues that imputation constituted a methodology that was used frequently with peasants, particularly through the introduction of sociodramas through which peasants would reenact their memories in puppet theater that would prevent, present research results, all of which took place at cursillos, training workshops for act, Anouk activists. Your, let me just make sure again, you are seeing the photo of the puppet show, good. Similar in many ways to the approaches of Paulo Freire and Augusto Poal, Fallas saw the imagination as a tool for bringing to light forgotten memories and reinterpreting them in the context of the needs of the present. As I hope to demonstrate, this strategy required a radical interpretation of the researcher's craft. What was research for Anouk activists? Most peasants who made up Anouk's rank and file and many of its local leaders were illiterate or had only completed the first year or so of primary school. Between the exigencies of their agricultural labors and their commitment to occupying haciendas, they had little or no time they could dedicate to collecting historical information. But even my own collaborative experience with indigenous researchers, all of whom were schooled and most of whom were serious readers, suggests to me that our academic mode of conducting research through the systematic collection and subsequent analysis of data is frequently not the model used in collaborative projects. And it was certainly not the template used by the Fundacion del Caribe. To the contrary, for them, research was more likely to be the collective analysis of information to which some of them already had access. Thus, collaboration combined academic rigor in the collection of information with a process of interpretation 
which was controlled by local activists who gauged the relevance of this information in light of their own needs. So how did this process evolve on the Colombian coast in the 1970s? To answer this question, we need to identify the contexts in which we can reconstruct information from Fals's archive. That is the spaces in which popular research practices can be observed and evaluated. In my opinion, the most fruitful scenario for exploring the popular exercise of the imagination and how it constituted a form of research is a series of illustrated pamphlets produced by the Fundacion del Caribe in collaboration with Anouk and with local campesino narrators. These histories encoded in comics look on their face to be testimonials of peasant struggles of the 20th century. But if we dig more deeply into them, we can imagine how the project of researching and writing these graphic histories functioned as a space in which peasants and external researchers could exercise and combine their imaginative faculties. It's true that the formal collection of materials was in the hands of the Fundacion del Caribe, but the interpretive process and the composition of these comics constituted a research scenario in which peasant activists imagined themselves as historical actors and inspired by their forebears could make history in their own right. The Fundacion del Caribe published their four graphic histories in collaboration with Anouk between 1972 and 1974, each between 15 and 20 pages in length, illustrated by Ulyanov Chalarca, a working class artist who earned his living painting portraits of members of the Monteria elite or religious images. Chalarca was also known for his caricatures of local eccentrics. These pamphlets took some six months to produce, including both the time dedicated to research and to composition. Chalarca also contributed drawings for an illustrated booklet sponsored by young evangelicals, which I'll come back to later in this talk. Chalarca's graphic histories were constructed out of a chain of conversations, bringing together actors with different life experiences and talents. The agenda was developed by Anouk leaders in collaboration with the Fundacion del Caribe researchers, leading to the search for historical materials in local archives and the public interviewing of elderly peasants who participated between 1920 and 1960 in mass mobilizations. Chalarca would take visual notes at these events. Here he is with Florentino Montero, an Anuk leader in the button shirt, Nestor Herrera from the Fundacion del Caribe in the Jersey, and a narrator from San Onofre Sucre, who's gesturing as he tells his story. After the narrator was finished, Chalarca would share his sketches with the public, receiving constructive criticisms to help him add details and correct aspects of his depictions. A committee in Monteria made up of the NUC leaders and members of the Fundacion would fill in the comics grid, combining the sketches into panels and adding speech balloons and captions. After a NUC approved the final version, it was used in assemblies and cursillos. Deciphering a comic, even for non-literates who listened to someone reading the verbal contents out loud, which is what happened on the coast, is a type of imputation. The reader of any comic must reconstruct in her imagination a world that's represented on paper by a minimalist constellation of icons and phrases. The reading of a comic sequence is something we learn. From childhood, we become skilled at navigating the passage from one panel to the next, filling in the details so as to construct a continuous narrative. But today I wanna to go further than that. The imputation involved in the Fundacion del Caribe comics involved more than the active participation of the reader. It made imputation into an investigative and political strategy. We can see how this process worked on the ground in a series of photos. Here, Uliano Chalarca is seated in front of a thatched hut, a group of children looking over his shoulder. He is drawing a portrait of an elderly Afro-Colombian man wearing a striped shirt and holding a machete, resting in front of a white Jeep, which was Fals's Jeep. The sitter is identified on the flip side of the photo as El Mello, the twin, whose birth name was Ignacio Silgado, an activist from San Onofre who would be given the role of narrator in the Felicita Campos graphic history. Each of the illustrated booklets 
featured a semi-fictional narrator based on a well-known local leader, but combining the testimonies of various narrators. El Mayo's reputation as a grassroots organizer led the committee to adopt his visage in their recounting of the story of Felicita Campos, who defended her community's lands and suffered attacks by the police, taking her claim to the national capital of Bogota. The presence of Silgado in the graphic history reminded readers that the protagonists of past struggles lived among them. As they experienced the immediacy of Chalarca's drawings, nourished with the identifiable faces of their neighbors, campesinos would begin to see themselves as protagonists of history. They would imagine themselves as the heirs of the, to the historical actors depicted in the comics and would move to take action themselves. In order to comprehend how the collaborative dialogue was made possible, we must take a look at how conceptual parad paradigms and research methodologies were negotiated among the various members of the participatory team. That is, we must observe the steps through which the epistemology of a particular project was defined. This is clear in Escucha Cristiano, a pamphlet prepared by the Fundación for a group of young evangelicals in Cerete near Monteria. <clears throat> the text itself does not provide sufficient information to identify the activist repertoire that guided its production. It's similar to any other pamphlet aimed at a popular audience that employs liberation theology to link biblical texts to the social realities of its readers. However, Falsborda's personal archive allows us to take a peek behind the scenes at the negotiations that established the epistemological boundaries of the project. The archival dossier that contains documentation of the process of production of Escucha Cristiano began to be compiled in 1973 when Anouk asked the Fundación del Caribe to conduct an ethnographic study of Protestants in the hope that it would open new paths for organizing a social sector that had traditionally resisted leftist ideas. The Fundación was perhaps the best candidate to undertake such a task, because in addition to its close relationship with the peasant movement, Falsborda was a Presbyterian, and La Rosca's funding came from the Presbyterian Church of the United States. Maria Cristina Salazar, a sociologist and Fal's wife, dedicated several months to the study of a Pentecostal church in Cerete near Monteria, and she prepared a report documenting the reasons why its members had converted to Pentecostalism and why they were leery of participation in Anouk. The dossier documents the process by which the Fundación undertook this exercise, one that they deliberately called an experiment in collaboration with the Society of Young Christians, an organization affiliated with an evangelical Presbyterian congregation in Cerete. As they state in one of the dossier's documents, the Fundación agreed to participate in this project because they saw it as an opportunity to refine their methodology. And I quote from the document, the pamphlet is a first exp experiment. Other pamphlets should keep in mind the results in order to modify the presentation and contents. Although it is not a Marxist pamphlet, it should be conceived as coming out of dialectical Marxism, as it points out and utilizes biblical contradictions between ideology and religious practice that demonstrate or lead to the class struggle." End quote. I suspect that the Fundación followed its habitual process of organizing workshops in which the young participants could familiarize themselves with the agrarian history of the region and Anouk's foundational documents, but I didn't find documentation of such events in the dossier. It's clear, however, that they met because the dossier contains a memorandum of understanding between the Society of Young Christians and the Fundación del Caribe, agreeing that the youth group would exercise complete control over the intellectual contents and the distribution of any publications arising, arising out of the project. Following their agreement, the youth group prepared a script containing the verbal contents of the pamphlet, which Ulyanov Chalarka followed as he produced the accompanying images. Each page of the pamphlet juxtaposes biblical texts with interpretations that contextualize them within the political, social, and economic circumstances of the Car Caribbean peasantry. We can see this in this image. 
in which Jesus's option for the poor is contrasted with the exploitation of peasants by money lenders. If this were a conventional set of field notes that I found in the archive, the empirical evidence collected would have been compiled and organized followed by a report. In this case, however, the procedure is inverted. The, re the project begins with a research report supplying background information about a similar community, followed by an agreement defining the participatory process. In this way, they were able to erase the distinction between observers and observed that characterizes conventional research projects. The various participants, including Maria Cristina Salazar, the youth group, Julian Chalarca, and other Fundacion activists, all assumed the role of observers and none of them were reduced to the status of the observed, <clears throat> particularly because Salazar's fieldwork had been conducted with a different congregation. In addition, and perhaps more importantly, the principal investigators, the members of the youth group, used a methodology that diverged radically from the intellectual tradition of the Fundacion. They used biblical exegesis to analyze the social circumstances in which they lived. In this way, Escucha Cristiano resulted out of the fusion of conventional social science, Marxism, and an evangelical epistemology. Action research was premised on a dialectical relationship between research and action. The systematic study of society encouraged the adoption of particular political practices and in turn, direct action opened possibilities of new avenues of research. Such synergy unfolded through a process that La Rosca called critical recovery, recuperación crítica. The identification by researchers of those historical elements that could serve as tools for contemporary activists. Nestor Herrera, who you saw in the photo from San Onofre, a Fundacion member from Cincelejo, explained to me how critical recovery worked. And I quote, Fals encouraged the people to converse. They would tell Chalarca what things had been like, the details, the anecdotes. What we did was something like idealizing things in order to make them a reality, end quote. This idealizing process converted narratives into political politically useful concepts. We can visualize this process in the pages of Loma Grande, the first of the Fundacion's graphic histories. Loma Grande presents the history of a successful peasant mobilization in the early 1920s against the matricula, a system of debt peonage that bound rural workers to haciendas. Part of a broader wave of socialist organizing that swept across Colombia during the second decade of the 20th century. Grassroots organizations were founded in Monteria, led by Vicente Adamo, an Italian socialist, and Juana Julia Guzman, the daughter of a peasant family who was employed as a cleaner in Monteria's marketplace. One of their objectives was to establish legally recognized communities in public lands that the peasants had colonized with the aim of, project of protecting their small holdings against the depredations of hacienda owners. These communities, which Fals recounts were organized under socialist principles, came to be known as baluartes or bastions. In 1922, the baluarte of Loma Grande on the outskirts of Monteria was the scene of a violent confrontation provoked by the police, which resulted in the deaths of several peasants and their supporters, as well as a police lieutenant. The peasant leadership was subsequently imprisoned and Adamo was deported. When Fals arrived in Monteria in 1972, he interviewed Guzman, who told him the story of Loma Grande. I discovered the transcript of the conversation in his archive, a text composed in the form of a script with questions and answers as in an interview. But when I listened to the tape recording of the encounter, I was surprised to find that it wasn't really an interview. It was an animated conversation among elderly peasants reminiscing about events in the distant past with very little participation by Falsborga. In other words, we might do better to think about this encounter as a kind of research seminar among peasants. It took place at the time of the first occupation of a large hacienda, La Antioqueña, by Anouk. The retrieval of Juana Julia's memory in the first wave of peasant activism in the 1920s 
led her to suggest that Anouk establish collectives in occupied lands similar to the Baluartes. In the long run, her proposal was not entirely successful. Anouk founded Baluartes to organize the distribution and cultivation of occupied land and to channel the political sentiments of its inhabitants. But their efforts failed for lack of support and because the peasants never clearly understood their political function. Nonetheless, the introduction of Baluartes led the, found, the Fundacion to conduct research on early socialist movements, an excellent example of what Fals called critical recovery. The Fundacion has had at its disposal important historical evidence, including testimonies, archival documentation, and photos. Nevertheless, Chalarca had to impute the history of Loma Grande as he rendered it visually. On this page, we can see Chalarca's rendition of the demands of the Baluartes in the top panel. Some of them land work or war on the matricula could be represented in comics icons that were immediately recognizable. Other components of the daily functioning of the Baluartes, health and union education weren't as susceptible to visual representation, although, but although they were crucial in the understanding of what a Baluarte was and should be. The fuzziness of the concept of the baluarte is most clearly depicted in the bottom panel, which synthesizes the essential facts about of the historical moment. Quote, they occupied the lands of Loma Grande, which was baptized baluarte rojo, red, red bastion. They also occupied lands in Canalete and Callejas, as Juana Julia told Fals in the interview. The three drawings that comprise that bottom panel crystallized the creation of the Baluarte Rojo at three simultaneous moments, all of which depict agricultural labor, which was after all the defining feature of the community. All three of the moments drawn by Chalarca depict agricultural labor, which was of course at the center of the Baluarte's purpose. But how to impute the political intentions of Guzman and Adamo? The caption at the bottom of the panel is somewhat critic. Quote, Baluarte is a position achieved in struggle and must be defended, end quote. What did this mean to a peasant reader, particularly to an illiterate reader whose gaze was automatically directed to the depictions of agricultural labor? I suspect that the authors of the booklet expected this answer to be answered in group discussion, this question to be answered in group discussion, since the graphic histories were meant to be read collectively. In this sense, critical recovery was an ongoing process that required participation, even after publication of educational materials. Chalarca's panels indicate how critical recovery juxtaposed the memory of the past with action in the present. Other Fundacion comics are substantiated by lengthy interview transcripts in which I was able to locate the sources of the comics captions and speech balloons. I haven't been able to find many similar sentences in the Loma Grande transcripts, which might have inspired Chalarca's sketches. I did, however, find other sources of inspiration that he undoubtedly drew on, including photos of the occupation of La Antioquena, which appear to have served as models for Chalarca's description of the agricultural activities in Loma Grande in the 1920s. I don't think this was by accident. Many comics artists draw on their everyday lives to produce the images that evoke empathy among their readers. In this case, that empathy had a political purpose. What better way to lead campesinos to empathize with Guzman, Adamo, and their followers than to create an iconic depiction that superimposed the labors of the occupiers of La Antioquena with those peasants from 1920s Loma Grande? This visual juxtaposition is a clear example of how critical recovery worked. As campesino readers analyzed the similarities between their lives and those of the activists of the 1920s, they came to identify themselves as the central actors in their own history. They came to own their own political process through historical interpretation. As a conclusion to my research in Felsborda's archives, I facilitated a series of eight workshops with popular organizations in various parts of Colombia that employ participatory methodologies. ANUC, the indigenous movement, environmentalists, health workers, community organizations, progressive research institutes, and groups of academics. 
I discovered that the core of the Fundacion's methodology, critical recovery, was really only on the radar of a few of the publics with which I conversed. The indigenous movement, where, such as this photo from the Asociación de Cabildos al Norte del Cauca in Northern Cauca, where La Rosca's activist research in this had uncovered the history of the establishment of 18th century indigenous collective land holdings called resguardos, institutions that were still functioning in the 1970s and could be strengthened through critical recovery. A study group affiliated with CNEP, a Jesuit research institute, which was involved in assisting an indigenous community in the Guajira Desert in its struggle against the encroachment of a massive coal mine. Um, in the 1970s, CNEP also engaged in research experiments similar to those of Fals Borda. And the Corporación Convivamos, a community organization operating in one of the marginal barrios on the hills above the city of Medellin, a group with which Pilar Riaño is intimately familiar. It was clear to me that attempts by the indigenous movement at revitalizing their institutions through historical research and education were ultimately more successful and long lived than was the reintroduction of the Baluarte, an institution that had fallen from the memory of most coastal peasants. I also discovered that many of the organizations I met with had adopted participatory methodologies and saw them as emancipatory, but they implemented them as a fixed series of research techniques, as opposed to an open-ended methodology that fused the work of the imagination with the generation of political strategies. In part, this has a great deal to do, I think, with the differences between the heady political atmosphere of the 1970s and today, when a much hoped for peace process appears to be in the process of being dismantled and over a thousand grassroots leaders have been assassinated. One of the workshop participants asked, and I quote, what do we do today when the revolution is no longer around the corner? There is no unified program for social transformation that might resonate in the academic world, nor among individuals and in social movements, end quote. Some of the participants suggested that participatory research provided contexts in which local meanings of current demands, such as for justice, could be explored. Others meditated over how activist projects such as indigenous land occupations could serve as platforms upon which alternative forms of research could be harnessed to concrete political objectives and where young people could ex experience how history is not only narrated but made. Still others looked to participatory research as a space for training activists as well as a space for healing. Finally, for those of us in the academic world, our own research into the history of Latin American social science can itself become a vehicle for a process of critical recovery that can contribute to nourishing grassroots organizations. Uh, I hope I, I limited myself to 25 minutes, I don't know. Thank you. That's perfect, thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Uh, amazing um, presentation you've taken us through there. Um, I will now hand over to Pilar, uh, who is going to help us draw out further how we can um, learn from this fantastic presentation and this book to think about our work doing peace building in Colombia today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wen, for the invitation. And thank you, Joanne, for the book and for the presentation. And to Andre and Rodemos El Dialogo as well for organizing this. Um, it is quite an honor to comment on this book. And uh, what I would like to do is to begin um, a little bit with the acknowledgement, some acknowledgement to um, what this uh, book suggests to me and, and as well situated myself. Uh, and then I will uh, make an attempt uh, to talk about the implications of Joanne's book uh, for peace building today. Uh, well, for peace building, oh, I don't know if it's just to kind of rescue or try to save the, you know, the peace agreement at this moment. Anyway, um, so let me start with the, the, the acknowledgement of the book because uh, to read it for me, um, I just found that it's such a compelling work of intellectual history and uh, the history of the early history of this idea of action research or participatory action research. 
uh, and it's an idea that is uh, it has captured worldwide imaginations. Um, you know, collaborations uh, definitely mass use and abuse. You know, definitely we can say that you know Paris one of those ones that you see it as uh, you quite clearly. It, it describe in the book, uh, you know, like we see it in all kinds of institutional environments and sometimes put to use that we may wonder about the action uh, and the participatory components. Um, and as well, like uh, what I found as well is that how the, the book and Joanne's work uh, combine in a really fasc a fascinating re reading of um, Orlando Falsborda's archive. Um, and as you say, a, a, a reading, um, alone and against the grain of those archives. And uh, as well, it is a, a, a work of historical memory reconstruction that uh, brings to the forefront, um, I think, the work and the ideas and the voice of uh, False Borda, but as well of uh, his interlocutors and co-laborers at the Fundación El Caribe. Um, for me as well, it, it just uh, offers a, a quite ethnographically situated inquiry uh, into a very critical um, historical period, um, I would say in Colombia, but in, in Latin America, uh, you know, a time where we see, you know, the 1960s uh, and 70s, the rise of social protest um, and as well armed struggle um, and against capitalist encroachment um, over the land and as well um, the deepening uh, or the positioning of uh, radical political projects and sectarian politics uh, that uh, define you know, uh, a quite polarized and violent context. And I think uh, um, this is something that came to characterize uh, the dynamics of um, peace and war and the dynamics of um, organizing work and intellectual work in the Caribbean coast and much of Colombia for decades. Uh, so quite important historical period. Um, also, I also appreciate in reading it, uh, this work that is not, is uh, the contribution in terms of locating power, uh, not just as the product of an individual or single intellectual and activist um, uh, trajectory, but uh, in the historical juncture, uh, social movements, archives, and geography is quite important that came to shape, to shape the core ideas of this project. And, uh, and I think that detailed historical reconstruction is amazing, uh, Joanne, you know, the detailed archival work and how you come to not only reconstruct you know, in detail events, but even the relationship between the illustration and the photography or the, or the, or the, or the recording. Um, and um, within this, um, this allow us to understand the, the prevalence at the time of a project that as you have highlighted in the book and in your presentation, it turned to creativity and critical thinking as major um, um, you know, uh, ignitions for um, knowledge production, uh, for thinking in a transformative way. But at the same time, it is a reconstruction that is not shy to highlight the struggles of this project with this very universalist and uh, sometimes elitist, and I will add patriarchal idea of knowledge production. That is so, it's, it's, we can really see and read the tensions and the frictions in this project. Um, so um, thank you for this, uh, Joan. I, I just said that I would like to uh, briefly situate myself here because um, I would say that my own trajectory as a public intellectual, as a Colombian public intellectual, is deeply entangled in the historical reconstruction that you did. You know, I came as a student in, of anthropology to the Universidad Nacional uh, of Colombia in Bogota. And okay, I'm dating myself, but anyway, that's okay. In the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, where and uh, my first uh, ethnographic work, uh, or you know, use um, uh, participatory action research. I went on from uh, to work in CINE for several years, and uh, within that, that work in CINE was with action research and brought me to the Caribbean coast, uh, where I met Victor Negrete and the Fundación El Snu, where I met um, as well, and then did work with the Anuk, and um, I, you know, I think, and, and then later with the time, it's, it's also. It was the work of the historical memory group as a researcher that brought me back to the Caribbean coast and meeting as well with several of the people that you mentioned uh, to, for the work that we did around uh, women and war in the 
in the Caribbean coast. So a lot of um, my personal history is entangled here. Uh, I mix with my own tensions in, uh, in, in, and the traje trajectories that you trace. And so in that way, I could say that definitely what I'm offering here is a very partial situated um, uh, perspective as, uh, as a scholar um, that, uh, and as uh, someone that is entangled in this history. Um, so when asked me to comment about um, uh, what are the implications of Joanne's book for peace building, and uh, for the current situation in Colombia. And um, of course, that is a challenge to draw something like as clearly. But um, let me, I just would like to start with a quote that actually Joanne included in her, um, in her presentation now. Uh, and it is the quote of this participant in one of uh, the workshops that Joanne conducted to talk about you know, uh, participatory action research and how social movements and different uh, social groups in Colombia um, see uh, what are some of the contributions of this work of the Fundación El Caribe of uh, False Border and Participatory Action Research. Um, and um, I'm going to repeat the quote because it's of relevance. Uh, Joanne, the quote, how he was a participant in one of the workshops that you conducted in Medellin, uh, who reflected and mentioned, um, and I quote, what do we do today when the revolution is no longer around the corner? There is no unified program for social transformation that might resonate in the academic world nor among intellectuals in social movements, end of quote. Um, and I think this participant brings a pivotal point uh, to think about and to think with the work of the Fundación and uh, the question of their contribution. Um, I'm referring here to this participant's concern, uh, a sense of loss. It seems that there is a little bit of a sense of, you know, what to do. Um, with um, uh, the lack of a unified program uh, for social transformation. And um, I want to turn here for a moment uh, to indigenous and feminist uh, par uh, scholar and activist, if Tak, uh, to interrogate this idea further. Um, Tak argues that implicit to any social research project, there is a theory of change. And I think it is as well very much embedded in the whole idea of uh, uh, di uh, dialectical interrogation of knowledge and, and action that is part of participatory action research. Uh, but let me highlight it. Uh, what uh, if talk highlights is that uh, she says, and I quote, the implicit theory of change will have implications for the way in which a project unfolds. What we see as the start or end of a project, who is our audience? Who is our us, quotations? How we think things are known and how others can or need to be convinced. A theory of change helps to operationalize the ethical stance of the project, what are, what is, what are considered data, what constitutes evidence, how a finding is identified and what is made public and keep private or sacred, end of quote. Um, Joan, after quoting this participant in the book, um, you, you state that the Fundacion, that the research of the Fundacion was steeped in universal revolutionary ideologies. Um, it, was a, it was a concept of revolutionary change as this type of idea of change that is a new societal, societal beginning, a total change of regime. Um, and that was the idea implicit in their work and from that perspective, their work did not succeed, um, quotations mark. And it is difficult and might be difficult to see the legacy, you know, in terms of that idea of transformation or that idea of action. Um, and also, you know, their work certainly, as you uh, quote, was uh, threatened by sectarian and positive understanding of change as universal and tied to regime change and its location with an ideology that it tend to uh, consider uh, the popular actor or the popular subject as a kind of homogeneous rather than um, uh, differentiated and diversified by intersections of race, class, uh, territory, gender, age, and sexuality. But what I would like to see, uh, to, to argue that what I learned from reading the, the book is that implicit in the work of the Fundacion and Fast Border Project, 
uh, particularly in those strategies that Joanne reconstructs so well, so well in the book of critical recovery, systematic devolution and imputation. I think you pronounce it like that. Um, implicit to that, there was other ideas of change. And this other idea of change was less associated with ideology of regime tra transformation and instead was, and instead was more linked to a restorative project, if I may call it like this, uh, to a critical and creative way of seeing, seeing, of seeing the world. And I think that's for that reason, the, the, the image of Ulyanov drawing and someone looking over his shoulder, seeing, and the peasant looking at him, seeing, you know, the, this whole, whole inter interaction um, around seeing. So this seeing over the shoulder against the archival grain in the ebbs and webs of the water waves of, or marshlands uh, through the soundscape of, you know, the Caribbean coast uh, and uh, via oral history. And um, this whole idea of generating new concepts and ideas that um, combine imagination, orality, and grounded knowledge. I see that as uh, speaking of um, a, a, an idea of change that instead of transforming a regime, restores relations to the land, to the territory, among each other in different ways. So, um, uh, and I think it, it also um, this um, was this idea of change was also embedded in the way that the as a foundation um, and the project that lasted three, uh, three years they were quite um, determined to ensure that the products of research um, will have a life be, beyond you know like the academic article or the archive and um, and that was you know like that why the emphasis on. Uh, how in as well, you know, the use of visual graphic materials. So um, that for me, these uh, ways um, and these um, um, concepts and strategies situated local knowledge, or I think uh, um, false word also call it popular knowledge, um, in whatever ways we want to refer to the more indigenous situated granted knowledge or native knowledge. Um, it, it did um, refer to those strategies uh, of local knowledge in relationship to um, uh, the bringing to the knowing of affect, emotion, and the senses, uh, and those as the sources of knowledge and transformation. So I think the task of understanding for me that was at, uh, or the task of inquiry that they did so um, creatively was uh, very much um, um, related to recognizing links to territory and to the land and, um, and situated knowledge as this feeling uh, or the knower as this feeling, thinking being, uh, senti pensante, um, situated in land, water, history. And in that way, I think it is uh, where they also saw the appropriation, yeah, either via imputation, either via critical recovery, awareness, or learning history was transformative. And, and I think uh, the idea of consciousness very much here went beyond what uh, it was uh, during the time and for year, many years, a very narrow understanding of what is consciousness raising as kind of ideology integration, and he arrived became a way more organic, holistic, situated project. And I think it is on this basis, you know, like later on, this is the type of um, critical uh, research engagement uh, that um, it is embedded in many of the indigenous um, epistemologies and ontologies. Um, so um, I think I'm, I'm going to conclude um, very uh, soon. So I think uh, uh, what I find that um, their contributions uh, in this way, their fingerprints um, and legacies to peace building um, is uh, envisioning this, this type of relationships and in highlighting this type of relationships. And why I say that this is a contribution to, to peace building or the contribution to think about peace or to think about how, how to strengthen peace. I think um, um, 
it, a key element in any a peace building plan is the strengthening of local peaceful coexistence strategies. And the recognition, and it is quite clear in Colombia, how at every uh, local uh, level in every single region of Colombia, there is a history of peace building. Um, so I think uh, that that is uh, quite important to recognize. And uh, considering that the impact of war in regions like the Caribbean coast are seen in relationship to the massive displacement and dispossession uh, from the land, but also it, its implications in terms of culture, um, the loss of life and the loss of uh, history in the case of all the, uh, uh, the people, the leaders from Anouk that had been lost to violence. I think uh, what I see is that the way that uh, some local organizations and community organizations, including the Fundación El Sinú or collectives like the uh, Colectivo de Comunicación Montes de Maria have turned this legacy is precisely to use this type of creative strategies to restore uh, relationships and to reconstruct uh, those uh, uh, relationships that had been uh, fractured or destroyed by the impacts of violence. Um, so I, I just to conclude um, in our workshop, our participant in your workshop, um, in this case, one in the Universidad Nacional in Bogota, uh, reminded everyone uh, with the inter intervention that this participant did that, and I quote, the peace accord implies constructing a new narrative, not just fulfilling the different points of the accord, end of quote. Uh, and uh, this participant uh, sp spoke about this, about how uh, this was important to uh, uh, revive, that was the term used, transformational categories. And I think uh, it, the Fundacion, the, the work of the Fundacion, the work of Als Borda and the amazing work that Joanna, Joanne did in this, to, in, in this book uh, does precisely that. Um, and, um, and it is uh, pre precisely offering ways of seeing and restoring relationships that hold transformative potential and means to strengthen peace, peace building initiatives. And I think for that, uh, the idea that false border works uh, throughout, uh, you know, in Historia de Ole la Costa and in many of his, uh, in his writings about, par, uh, about the idea of par as a philosophy of life is quite critical in that way. Um, and uh, seeing that that transformative potential, uh, I see this as a, you know, as quite relevant in this moment of massive political challenges to the peace agreement that threaten to its core its implementation, and make it quite elusive, if I may say. Um, and particularly this whole idea of how to uh, strengthen peace with capital, you know, P. Uh, uh, P. Um, so I think it is a moment in which uh, we can use all the imagination as possible in, in the same way that, you know, um, Joan highlights about how the work of FALS and the work of, of the Fundacion during that period uh, used during, the, during their years that they did, how they turned to imagination as a, as a key strategy. So I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilar. That's fantastic. Um, so we'll now move into a, a Q&A session and you're all very much invited to um, say in the chat if you would like to speak. I'll also try and keep an eye on the hands raised, but I think writing in the chat me or I have a question or whatever would be, would be helpful. Perhaps while everyone's getting their thoughts together, I will take advantage of my chair's privilege and ask a question myself. Um, I was laughing when uh, Pilar was reading out that quote about new narratives because I also had my copy of the book open at precisely that quotation um, because I, I find it so interesting um, for a reason that, that I'll explain. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated the book, about the book is how it, it makes a very important um, comment between the role of research and um, and peace building today or action research or action that can transform. And I think that you make also a very important comment, Joanne, in the book that, and, um, that 
the appropriation of the idea of participatory action research has tended to downplay the action side in recent years. Now many NGOs and um, and scholars will say, oh yeah, we did participatory, participatory research because we went to a place and talked to the people and, and you know, ticked the box. And, and it almost reminds me sometimes also of the way of participation that the Santos government organized. You know, you have spaces where people come and talk and therefore they, they participated. A thousand people participated in this policy, but did they really participate? Um, and, and putting the action back in, it strikes me as, as really important. And the reason I was interested in this quotation about um, the need to transcend the current situation of violence with new narratives is because in Rodemos el Dialogo, we participated in a project um, in 2017 and 2018, precisely which sought to build new narratives to counteract the narratives of hatred against the polarization, the narratives that had been spread by the no vote and the plebiscite uh, by talking to civil society participating participants, um, artists, musicians, um, teachers, journalists from around the country to try to find out how, how new narratives could in fact remobilize the country or mobilize the emotions of Colombians to support peace. Um, and it was very challenging. And I think that one of the differences between today and the context um, at which Pilar described it being entangled in um, really nicely of, of, of when Faz was and the Rosca were developing their strategies. Um, the, the context was very different also in terms of the mediums with which we can transmit narratives. And I think today we have a huge challenge, which is social media. Um, it's both a challenge and an opportunity. And I wonder how, um, whether either of you have any thoughts as to how um, how participatory action research could be deployed through social media networks, which so serve to um, shape opinion today by recuperating um, local narratives uh, about of concern and, and things like that. Um, we have a, a question now from um, Andre. We have a, cost, a comment from Oscar Guardiola. I don't know, Oscar, if you would like to turn your camera on and just say, hello before you leave um, or if I'll read this for you oh, he's gone he says that wonderful to hear you both thanks for your work on peace building and reinventing the other narratives we need if they're if we're to rescue peace efforts in Colombia um, and he's just expressing gratitude to both of you for coming and um, I'll now pass over to Andre and anyone else who has questions please uh, let me know in the chat Andre yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wen. Yeah, no, I think I want to, I mean, I, I, I had, I thank you so much, uh, Joanne and, and Pilar for, for your comments and for this very interesting um, presentation and, and commentary. I guess I was gonna ask something along the same lines of Gwen, because what I was thinking is that, uh, I guess Orlando Fassborn also, uh, I mean, what we have heard from Joanne is that it was very much paying attention to the to the communities and the organizations that he was working with, but to communicate this to a broader audience. And 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 I think I want to focus on the audience. Uh, I wanna I wanna see or I wanna sort of ask Joanne um, what are the challenges for for community and the opportunities for doing a similar sort of work today uh, from an academic perspective to trying to have a broader impact in, a, in, a, in an audience that uses social media. So in a digital age, that's, that's, that's like the sort of first question that comes to my mind, but it also is connected to, to, to something that Gwen was mentioning too and, 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 and Pilar that has to do with, with the action part of it. Also, what the, how, how the new technologies or how this new context in which we live changes the dialogue be, between the interlocutors and the researchers um, in order to try to do a similar exercise today. I mean, it's, it's widely known that sometimes you have research today that takes cameras and gives the cameras to interlocutors and tells them, here you are a camera, do your own story, communicate it the way you want to do it. But is, is that 
enough? Uh, is, is that part of the, of, the, of, of the transformation that is happening because of the technological uh, you know, innovation that, is, that brought us here today? Um, I guess those two questions will be very important because through that, we will also have to think about the role of academics in really trying to engage critical, critically with the transformation of global imaginaries um, in order to, to strengthen peace building in Colombia. Thank you, Andre. Um, do I have any more uh, questions for this round? In that case, perhaps I will. Um, Joanne, would you like to maybe respond if you have any responses to Pilar's uh, comments as well and um, and an answer in any way you like, and um, and then Pilar, and then we'll have another round of questions. Um, I'd like to thank Pilar. I, I she knows because it, she's cited in the book that that um, I've I've always been tremendously influenced by by what she writes, what she says, what she does, and I totally agree. Um, I think that the, the importance of the kind of work that Files was doing has a lot more to do with what's going on internally, locally, among people. Um, and it's something that um, I, th I think needs to be brought out more about what participatory action research can be. Um, and I think I felt it very strongly in the workshops, um, in, in the works with, with Convivamos, with, with Asin in the South, um, in various of the workshops. Um, I think that it's, that, I mean, the situation is so different today from what it was back then, right? Um, I don't know the people that I'm in contact with, I don't know how much they're rural people, how much they're using social media. Um, Cause it also depends on how, how much connectivity they have. Um, they certainly use WhatsApp all the time <laughs> because I get calls all the time from, from rural people. Um, I don't think it's just um, putting the technologies in the hands of people um, because I think the people are very different from who they were in the 1970s. I was really struck by this at, at, at uh, and it's in the, the last chapter of the book at, at several of the workshops where um, members of who you would call the grassroots, the interlocutors were also people who were trained. Um, so we have a, a very different situation today where um, I don't think academics necessarily always, in all cases, need to assume the role that Falls Borda did. Um, what, what I, while I was doing this project, I was also working with the uh, Casa de Pensamiento, which was a research unit of the Asociación de Cabildos del Norte del Cauca. And what we were basically doing was I was, I was helping them to do their own participatory research projects. Um, and I think that one of the roles that we would have as academics is to break the academic stranglehold and break the academic formats. Because um, when I first, encountered their projects of, of the Casa de Pensamiento, they were using traditional proposal formats that, that totally closed off any creativity. And what we did was work through how they could figure things out. Now, you know, I guess my main technology then is, is pencil and paper, um, which is what they had at their disposal. Um, and, and maybe the role of academics needs to become more facilitators for moving beyond our, 
our traditional academic ways of, of conceptualizing things. And I think we can play a really important role in that. Um, I don't know what Pilar has to say. No, that's fantastic, Pilar. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I also pause to think about um, when thinking about social media um, and what might be the potential that it may hold or where it broadens impact. Um, I think, yeah, there is always, with any new media, there is always the possibility of having a more democratizing, democratic process because it you know, opens the possibilities of ways to communicate. Um, and also, you know, the whole idea that social media is way more accessible, you know, absolutely every single social leader is a trendsetter or whatever is the expression for in Twitter, you know, like using all these kind of things, yeah, communication has become more readily available and that is extremely important. It saves lives, let's say it like that. It saves the lives of people. Um, so in that way, I think uh, uh, social media, um, it does have a, an important role within all, all of this. Uh, um, I'm not really sure, or what I couldn't so clearly say is in terms of how, how would I think about impact or action. And that I say, because I would say that then is when you go back to the key questions of participatory action research, for what? and for whom, and in what context. So maybe, yeah, social media and disseminated this, it may have more impact on outsiders and to become more aware, but I, I, I'm not, I couldn't say something so conclusive about where that, um, if, uh, if the idea of action research it is that is for whom, is for those who are seeking to transform that situation, in their daily lives or seeking to whatever, I'm not so sure that it does have, it necessarily makes a huge impact. Um, however, I also think that now, and uh, you know, the example of Joanne's book being transformed into now a graphic, you know, work, uh, what this is suggesting, I think uh, what it has widened, fortunately, academics now, we fortunately are challenged every day more and more by uh, all our interlocutors and collaborators in what we think are ways to disseminate and present the knowledge. And I think uh, we are challenged, it's not to kind of put in simplistic terms, the Joanne's book and now in a graphic novel. No, that is another form to transmit, disseminate, and uh, sometimes even way more uh, stronger to represent the knowledge. So I think, the use of multimedia creative ways now it has impacted and definitely broadens the impact uh, because it makes it more accessible, uh, more holistic, more dynamic, all of this. So that's what I would say in that way. And uh, I think also we as academics are every time uh, what I see and I have seen in my more kind of daily experience as an academic in Colombia increasingly I think um, various communities who have endured uh, academic researchers over the years and all, their, all our extractive practices, they increasingly are putting way more um, requirements in terms of what is what, if you are an engaged researcher and an, a researcher committed to change, this is what we expect from you. Um, and, and that's great. That's, I think it, that's extremely important. Thank you, Pilar. I think that's, that's so important, um, having heard many Colombian colleagues, uh, both academics and people who, to whom academia is done, um, uh, complaining about the extractive nature of much data collection and people getting quite tired of retelling their story, often stories of suffering and harm. Uh, putting the burden on, on the victim to retell their story over and over again. Um, that's increasingly showing up, I think, in critical research. So, so really important point. I have two questions now, one um, from Michael Keith and then Matthew. Michael, would you like to um, turn on your camera and, uh, and open your microphone? Lovely to see you there. Thank you. Um, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, 
and I speak from a position largely of ignorance. I know a little bit more about uh, Freire's work and Boyle and very little about Files Border. But um, so my question, which is ultimately simple, I was, I was tempted to actually ask a very flippant question about whether you thought about renaming your book after the last weeks of Donald Trump's period in office and the events in the Capitol. But um, uh, the real question actually I wanted to ask was that it, it was something that Pilar said, which um, made me think about participatory action research and the way it has been taken up in other contexts. And I wonder at times, and this is coming from a position of sympathy, whether the you described in a lot of detail the, the complexity of epistemology, of conceptualization, of the interplay of history and memory, performativity, and, and those sorts of complexities which you see in Boal and uh, Freire likewise. But that that complexity and subtlety, I don't think, is always reflected in a similar complexity of our understanding of the political, which tends to be slightly more Manichaean. And so I was wondering whether you thought that was a kind of a fair critique and whether that that was, and in a sense, that's part of the 1970s moment, potentially, question mark. But do you think that would be a, f a, a, f a fair assessment in terms of what you're saying? Thank you, Michael. Um, Matthew. Are you there, Matthew? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello, lovely to see you. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Pilar. I can't wait to read the book. Sounds amazing. It's a bit of a niche historian's question, I suppose. I just would be really interested in knowing, Joanne, if you could say something a bit more about the novelty or, or not of the the usage of imputation in historical writing in Colombia. I've spent a lot of time reading 19th century stuff and I it, it feels kind of familiar this voicing of subaltern actors. I appreciate it's a different more participatory way of doing it but I wondered if you could just expand a little bit or more on that because it sounded fascinating. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. And just a plug um, for everyone, the next Embrace Dialogue Academia seminar is going to involve uh, Peter Watson and Matthew talking about the role of football in the peace policy of Juan Manuel Santos. So um, yeah, I hope you'll all come to that. That's on the 25th of February at 6 p.m. Um, GMT. I think we also have a question uh, from Maria Fernanda. Is Maria Fernanda there? Hello, uh, thank you so much, Joan and Pilar for a wonderful presentation and discussion. And I would like to go back a little bit to what uh, Gwen was saying at the beginning and what Pilar also mentioned about changing the narrative. And I've seen the power and I've seen how really useful it is um, the tools of participatory research to uh, gather this information and really um, reach very, very sensible data. But then my question is, and this is a struggle that I made in my own research, is then how to have the same effect or a similar effect when you uh, communicate to people, these, these uh, two people who might be in policy making or who may have some opportunity to do something else than uh, what we can do as researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Marfe. And I think um, if the panelists don't mind, I've seen another hand come up now. And so perhaps we'll take one more question and then um, go back to you two. So we have uh, Will Kendall. Um, if you'd like to turn your mic on and camera and say hello. Hi. Um, I can't start my video. It says the host stopped it. So maybe <laughs> people don't right, want to. Sorry start. about that. Let's, I'll, I'll see if I can fix that while That's you're okay. talking. You go ahead. Um, Hi, no. thanks, thanks for a great presentation. Um, uh, super interesting book. Um, my own research is on the is on the sort of transformation of PAR. So I just wanted to ask a question to to Joanne. If, if there was one lesson that sort of contemporary versions of PAR could take from from Fowl's Border, um, what would it be? Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Will. Um, Perhaps we'll go in the reverse order this time. We'll start with Pilar. 
Okay, I, I think the bulk of the questions are for Joanne. So that does, uh, does uh, I only will go into the two uh, more specific ones and um, that in which I can comment. Um, and I think uh, in regarding to this, um, how we can use as well this complexity uh, that, you know, that uh, in the exploration of uh, power and the history uh, for the understanding of the political. I think that's how I understood, uh, uh, you know, how we can bring the more complex understanding to the political uh, uh, and to uh, probably to the explanation and what is happening in terms of politics uh, and the legacy of those years into, into that one. And, and I definitely, I, I agree that, um, that this is very much needed um, and is very much needed because I think it is the field of what is called the political uh, that has been narrowly uh, defined in terms of um, the kind of very um, political positioning of different actors and seeing the political as that terrain in which you, um, you know, uh, kind of um, struggle over ideas, um, struggle over ideas of society, uh, and, um, and uh, set very definite ways of doing things, um, and less link of the political to the political to ways of living. So I'm not being very concrete because I, 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 I wouldn't know how to say, but, but I think um, and the, the type of reading that Joanne does in her book about this period of history uh, uh, and the work of the of uh, Fars Borda as well uh, make us interrogate uh, how to understand um, the political and politics in way more complex ways. Um, you know, just to say that that's simply to say, uh, you know, to explain that the Fundacion failed because it didn't succeed at this project of broad transformation. Or, or to just explain it that it was, you know, like the fact of false word and living from the uh, from from the foundation was explained as a case of sectarian politics. I think it's way more complex what is involved in there. In terms of um, how uh, thinking about um, how to have uh, a similar effect with policymakers and how you know, like uh, how to talk to policymakers uh, from par. Um, I think uh, that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge uh, uh, to, to do it, and I agree. But it seems to me that one of the, the reasons why uh, many groups, um, grassroots organizations or communities are uh, sometimes um, um, interested in drawing in, on par, it is to precisely uh, to find means of speaking to policymakers. To say what they already know, what they already have been told, uh, but that needs some legitimacy in terms of some data information, uh, but also uh, that needs, um, you know, in order to be heard, it needs that kind of uh, a support. Um, but I also must say that um, um, understanding that uh, policy making is so tied to. Um, uh, governments in in charge and to transitions and changes, sometimes that makes it very difficult. They, today we may speak to a policymaker that is quite convinced of you know a number of different things, but comes a change of government and then there is a different policymaker. Um, but um, I think uh, uh, what I have seen in many of these projects is that there is an effort in creating uh, not only the type of um, uh, publication or outcome uh, that speaks to a wider audience um, and in a more accessible language, but also the desire to create that publication or that type of outcome that speaks to the uh, language of policy makers, which is very cost effect and very, you know, like a kind of person. So how to speak is, is one of the concerns of many communities, how to speak to policymakers that they listen to and they understand. I will leave it there. Thank you, Pilar. Joanne. Yeah, um, 
I think I might leave most of the policymaker stuff to, to Pilar. Um, except for thinking about policy from the ground up, um, at least in, in, in Cauca, there are many places where um, local governments are in the hands of, of uh, the, the population, of, of, of the kinds of people that Falbordo is working with or La Rosca is working with. And <clears throat> that's also a, a way to work with policy makers. And, and um, <clears throat> I just, I just wanted to mention that. Um, how do, how we talk about the political? One of the things that I've been doing, it got interrupted by the pandemic, but I'm going to do it when I can again, um, because unfortunately, I, the places that I was doing it, I don't think they have the bandwidth to, to have Zoom discussions, um, is that we were reading Chalarca's comics. Um, one thing that I discovered was when I read them with urban audiences, we'd read the whole comic and then we'd have debates and the debates were about the political, but not about the political in those big government terms. They were, they were more about questions of what is truth how do you know what is true? Um, how do you tell a story about what is true? And I think that's intensely political. Um, at the, in the rural areas, we usually got through two pages of the comic in four hours <laughs> um, because they brought, it, they brought it back to the ground. They brought it back to their daily lives. And so it stopped being political also in a standard sense. And it became more about vivencias, about everyday experiences and about how they experience their lives, um, which I think is, is, is really something that was central to, to what Fales Bordo was trying to do. And I think it's, to me, the main lesson that I would say if I was gonna choose one lesson from Fals Borda about participatory action. It's how, how he effectively laid out a, a, not a scheme, not a map, not, not a roadmap, because he didn't tell people exactly what to do. They, they're, yeah, there are plenty of techniques, but it wasn't the technique, it was the, it was the philosophy. Um, because in each instance, um, this will have to be worked out differently. But how, how do you harness a dialogue where people are being creative, where people are, are taking ideas and living them through their own lives in order to achieve something, in order to have a goal? And that's, I think, the central lesson that he, that I think he imparts and that I think it is equally useful today. Um, Okay, the question about imputation and historical writing. Um, I, ha I have a graduate student who's been working on the, um, on the novels of Nieto, uh, who is a volume two of, of Historia Doble, the, the only Afro-descended president of Colombia, who was president of Colombia for six months, roughly, eight months. Um, and I guess you could talk about imputation there as well, because what he's doing is he's taking his, he has three novels. Um, I know about two of them. Uh, one of them is a, a interracial love affair between a mestiz and a Spaniard. And another one is between a Moor and a Christian who are forced into exile uh, when the Moors are expelled from Spain. Um, this student is Somali and she's Muslim and she was very interested in, in the fact that Nieto used this example in order to talk about in the 19th century, in the mid 19th century about what he thought citizenship meant to 
people um, to various races, to various groups of ethnic groups of people in, in the coast. Um, and I think it's a it's a it's an example that Files ended drawing upon. Um, but he did it later. I'm not sure how much he knew about this when he was doing the work in, in with Anouk, but it certainly it certainly came to the fore in um in Historia Doble. Um should also mention that at the same time that Fals was doing this work, uh, Alfredo Molano was starting to write his cronicas. He was a student of Fals Bordas, and he was working at the same time on these cronicas as Fals Borda was. And, and in the archives in the Universidad Nacional, there are records of, of discussions that they had about these approaches. Um, so I, no, nobody was calling this imputation. That's something that Fall seems to derive in the mid eighties, the term imputation. Um, I remember asking Victor Negrete, who was in the Fundacion del Caribe about imputation. He had no idea what it was. Um, but it was implicit in, and, and as I mentioned, and as Michael Keith mentioned, it's, it's implicit in the work of all kinds of, um, of activists who were developing these approaches in the seventies. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, John. I have another question uh, from Jorge. Yeah, uh, yeah. First of all, thank you very much for for the presentation. It was it was really really interesting. Um, I was wondering a bit about, I mean, how this uh, participatory uh, methodology could be used in the context of, of today's Colombia by uh, the Truth Commission, which is uh, obviously, as we know, even though they've been trying to listen to 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 people from. Uh, every single region of the, of the country which were involved or affected by the who were involved or affected by the by violence they have a challenge ahead which is to 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 spread the message of the of the final report so i think there's a there's something very interesting in there of what we how can we use or how the trust commission could use these these methodologies in order to to spread the word of of the of the of the of the uh, of the final report, having in mind, of course, that it is it is because we've been talking about intellectuals and uh, and activists, but in this case, it is an organization of the government. So I, I think there's a, there's a question there, epistemological question there that it's interesting to 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 hear what you what you think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Do we have any final questions before we? Uh, wrap up the discussion. Okay, I think, um, Pilar, would you like to say anything about um, Jorge's question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> what I would say is, I think uh, uh, not thinking of power of the application of power as a whole, but thinking that there might be some key elements of power that may be are taking. I think in some of the work that the Truth Commission is doing now, uh, they are incorporating some elements um, and um, in two ways. One is I think um, given uh, the trajectory and knowledge accumulated and produced by so many uh, black indigenous uh, women organizations and others about you know, the, the conflict, the causes and all of that, the commission has been interpolated to use another, you know, has been, you know, does require to incorporate that. And the groups are quite clearly following to say, you know, those dialogues to really um, um, ask the commission to incorporate uh, that knowledge, but as well those perspectives and uh, the knowledge, uh, you know, the local ways of knowledge that they convey. So that was one, one way. In another, I would say that uh, the commission has interrogated itself a lot in terms of how to disseminate precisely what you asked Jorge, how to disseminate, uh, not just the, the final report, 
but most important uh, that task that they have in terms of recognition, acknowledgement, and you know what is the process of any commission, um, and you know uh, collects the ways to inquire about the truth, about what we mean by truth, testimony, witnessing, and all of that. And if I can use an example, um, for example, the the work that uh, the commission has been doing around exile um, in more than twenty five different countries and collecting, uh, I think it's up to 500 or more, I don't remember now, testimonies from people, Colombians living in exile. Um, one of the products that it was launched, um, I think uh, like a month ago, it was a graphic, a comic book, a graphic uh, um, a book, uh, basically with uh, that uh, visualizes and puts in a graphic narrative, uh, the stories of some of the Colombians in exile. So I think uh, uh, there is many, many possibilities. Um, the probably the major challenge uh, as in any truth commission that the commission is going to have is what they call social appropriation, how uh, the results of the report and the work of the commission are going to be appropriated socially to precisely strengthen peace building to ensure that, you know, uh, uh, Colombians assumes uh, core responsibility in terms of what's happened. And I think that is where they, they can draw a lot into some of the methodologies and ways to uh, share knowledge and uh, start new uh, new ways to, uh, or ways to, to share uh, from participatory action research. Thank you, Pilar. And it's fantastic to hear um, what you're saying about social appropriation. And perhaps I might just do a quick plug um, that Rodemos Dialogo is participating in some what they call laboratorios de co-creación de herramientas pedagógicas um, de apropiación social de la verdad, so social appropriation workshops to co-create um, uh, how to, to, to dynamize and, and, and encourage and mobilize around um, the findings of the Truth Commission. And I will share the link in the chat in a moment for anyone who is interested. Um, in, in participating in that. Joanne, if you'd like to comment on this and make any final comments um, uh, to, to wrap up the discussion. I just bring back something that uh, Pilar said to her commentary on, on that she just said on, uh, related to her commentary on the book. And it has to do with this uh, comic that just came out uh, about Colombians in exile. It's a really interesting comic. I just, I, I ordered it and it, I don't, it, it took a while to get here and um, I just read it last week. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that it's not so much about what happened to the people in Colombia as it is about the process by which they, other people, their, their children, for instance, found out about what happened and it's about building social relationships today um, as opposed to strictly about what happened 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, which I think relates directly to what to Pilar's initial commentary on my book. And it has to do with what PAR really can do, which isn't report the results of an investigation, but if I can try to have the tools for people to empathize um, and to participate in the process of knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can add something to what you just said, Joanne, because this is such a key point, that is that intergenerational dimension that is so important. Like when we think about impact or change or all these things, it tends to be thought outside the social sometimes. And, and for example, like what you hear more often from those engaged on the ground in participatory research is that the impact they wanted to see it in terms of intergenerational transmission of knowledge. That that if we want to solidify peace, uh, um, a, you know, recognize the truth of what happened, uh, acknowledge responsibility, do put attention to intergenerational transmission of knowledge. And that's why uh, the truths of the histories are not only, but as you highlight, uh, Joanne, what happened, but how is remembered, when is remembered, and at what moment someone decides to share 
their own personal experiences with their the people who are close to them to their immediate kin. So that I, I think that's such a key point, Joan. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you both um, so much. And thank you everyone for your questions and comments. Perhaps I'll just wrap up making three um, kind of conclusions from, from today's uh, discussion that I'm taking away. Um, and the first one is I think that the book really performs what it uh, describes in many ways. It is itself a, a critical recuperation of um, of a strategy and, and a set of discourses and experiences of the collective of Palasborda. And it's also the devolution of that uh, recuperation of knowledge, right? Not only through the writing of the book and the publication of the comic, which I know that we're all excited to see, but also the creation of spaces of dialogue uh, like this one, um, in which you can discuss uh, the implications and the legacy of Fals Borda and what we could learn from him today. I mean, I particularly enjoyed the last section of the book uh, where you take the findings to a whole lot of different groups of Colombians thinking about uh, political and social issues today to discuss with them uh, the legacy of PAR. And um, I think that's really performing the kind of, the, the the cyclical process which you describe being so central to Faz Borda's theory um, of research and action uh, dialectically. Um, so, so I think that's that's really generous of you to, to, to have this space and it, it seems really important also to have these discussions, not just to read the book, but also to talk about them to generate uh, awareness. And the second point I'd like to um, make about that I take away from today is the invitation that you've both um, made through Faz Borda uh, today for academics to break free of the established formats um, of both doing research and collecting data and generating theory and also dissemination and what that research is for and how we make it do something in the world, going beyond the framework of the impact factor that our universities require us to check box or um, going beyond the, the kind of the, the marketization of academic, academic life and really thinking creatively to, to build collaboratively with um, the people who we're interested in, in, in researching with to, to capture narratives or to, to, to think about narratives, not just as slogans, but narratives which can translate into concepts that mobilize, concepts that do something that are politically useful. And I think that's that's really important. And the third and final thing that I take away is this discussion about the role of the political in academia and in research. And what does that mean? What, what does the political mean in our work? Um, and I think that that for me, this, this question of research that helps to generate critical consciousness that helps to generate spaces of dialogue, both in the generation of knowledge and in the kind of dissemination of knowledge or outreach or pedagogy with that knowledge um, that can do various things. Firstly, to, to generate um, critical consciousness and awareness in a social fabric, whether that's through different generations or through uh, neighborhoods or through the internet and through internet communities. Um, but also to, to mobilize. And I think that that's really, really important, especially if we're thinking about the current context of Colombia and the extreme polarization left in the wake of the referendum campaign and then the 2018 presidential elections. As we move up to the context of more presidential elections next year in 2022, I think the role of researchers has to be to to, to, to use research as a space to think creatively and, and with the people that they research with their collaborators and act and mobilize because the only way to drive top down change is after all to build sufficient mandate from bottom up. And I think Joanne has really emphasized the importance of looking at bottom up processes, but that bottom up needs to, to, to build a, a connection with, with um, with the, with the top-down processes so that a, a government can be elected who is more committed to uh, peace building in the long term. Um, 
And I think that, that thinking through uh, the ways in which academia can contribute to that process, um, you've both uh, added a lot to our thought, thought processes about how we, can, how we can support that process of change in Colombia. So thank you both so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and your time um, here with us today. I invite everyone to turn on their cameras. Uh, we will take a picture and also to turn on their um, microphones so we can give a round of applause to um, our fantastic speakers. Um, so please do join me in thanking Pilar and Joanne for a wonderful discussion today. Thank you all so much. Don't, please, you can buy the book um, online, highly, highly recommended. And the Spanish version is out uh, later this year um, with El Rosario. And you can um, please follow Rodemos el Dialogo to uh, receive the invitation to the next event, which as uh, promised is with Peter Watson and Matthew Brown on football and um, Santos's peace policy. Uh, on the 25th of February at 6 p.m. So uh, I hope to see some of you there. Thank you all so much for coming and have a good uh, evening, afternoon, morning, 